I always get the lentil kale actually comes. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Lunch Talk Speaker Series. This is Amira Vaughn with us today, Hi. and she works with APEN, the Asian Pacific Environmental Network. And a few months ago, Dan, Linda, and I went to see Ami speak about the new, the new APEN report uh, in Sacramento. And we thought it would be really valuable for our staff to all learn about it and open, up, open it up to our webinar email list. So um, here is Ami. She's a second generation South Asian American born and raised on the East Coast. Her personal experiences have supported her awareness of how inequalities in the workplace as well as built a natural environment influence community health. Through her role at APEN, she offers an environmental justice and health equity lens to climate and energy policy in California. Please join me in welcoming Ami. Great. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm really excited to be here today. APEN, the office that I'm based in um, is just down the street, um, 17th and Broadway. Um, for folks that aren't familiar with APEN, we organize Asian American immigrant and refugee communities, specifically in Oakland, Chinatown, and in Richmond, where our communities, specifically in Richmond, live on the fence line of the Chevron refinery. So we've been doing organizing work um, for 26 years, we actually celebrated our 25th anniversary a couple months ago. Um, so this is a, it's a really exciting time, and I'm on the policy team where I support um, our state policy advocacy efforts, both kind of with agencies um, in the regulatory space as well as legislative advocacy. So I'm really excited to be here to share a little bit more about the research side of the work um, that I've been focused on related to our map and resilience report. Um, so really excited and hope, um, I'm gonna talk maybe for like a half an hour, but I'm hoping that we can spend, have a lot of the rest of the hour to, you know, have engagement from you all and see what are the opportunities and synergies to, to kind of draw from the recommendations and integrate equity um, in your work. So, the broad kind of title is Centering Equity in Climate Adaptation Resilience, um, although I'll be focused on mapping resilience, but um, this is kind of part one of a lunchtime series with you all. My, um, a colleague of mine at the Green Lining Institute, Sona Mona, uh, is working, and we kind of co-released a complementary report. Um, theirs is entitled Making Equity Real in Climate Adaptation Resilience. So you all are gonna get a, that talk as part two. Um, so that's kind of the theme for both. Um, let's see. Okay. So in terms of the outcomes that I hope that you all leave with today, um, really education and an understanding of the key findings from um, APEN's Mapping Resilience Report and thinking about how to use the report and its recommendations um, as a foundation for policy advocacy and policy strategies. Um, I also hope we can think through implementation and think about key opportunities and barriers for developing, applying, and operationalizing some of the frameworks that I'm going to name um, in planning decision making, specifically at the state coastal consistency, but maybe even partner kind of agencies and organizations you work with. So before I dive into the report, I want to kind of ground folks in the values with which APEN is really um, leading this work with. Um, and so the image on the left is a photo from, uh, or a sort of a graphic from the California Environmental Justice Alliance. Are folks familiar with that statewide alliance? Yes. Yeah? Um, so that's, APEN is a part, is a member organization of SEHA. And they created this graphic as kind of an image of the vision for a program that they have advocated very deeply around transformative climate communities, which many of you all may be familiar with. Um, and I think this is just one picture of what a resilient community could look like from the perspective of APEN. Um, and, you know, as you can see, there's access to clean energy, there's public transit, folks bicycling, there's people in cohesion and kind of supporting each other as neighbors, there's green space, um, it's clean, it's healthy, they're thriving. And 
I think achieving this vision for the neighborhoods that we work in requires more than just strengthening built infrastructure or um, solely kind of protecting natural resources. Although we know that those pieces of community resilience are, are really important, but our vision for resilience does really central, center communities, people, and neighborhoods and really thinks about those, protecting those that are on the front lines of the crisis, those that have been historically overburdened by the extractive economy and we, that we know will be most impacted by future disasters. And so that's kind of the vision. And so in the short term for us in our work, that means preparing neighborhoods to cope and respond to this new climate reality. Um, but in the longer term, and just moving to this image on the right, that um, it takes root to weather the storm. Um, it's fundamentally about building power and really addressing underlying systemic inequalities that are oppressing low-income communities of color. And so that's why this image of system, systemic, system change, not climate change, is really getting at that organizing um, and power building work that we're doing. Um, and so we're not here yet. But that's what sort of the framing that I want to offer for this report. Um, one other kind of key foundation to before we dive into the recommendations is um, this notion of the climate gap. Have, have folks heard about the, the climate gap or kind of have, have they heard the, of the term? See some nodding heads. Um, so for, in terms of the climate gap, we think of climate change as a threat multiplier worsening existing inequalities in health, housing, land use, um, and economic opportunities. Um, and the climate gap really underlines this way that climate disasters have unequal impact. And so those that are most impacted are consistently communities with the least resources to respond. And so in the current moment, we see a multitude of, of examples of the way the climate crisis is disproportionately impacting the state's most vulnerable communities. And I wanted to share some examples, um, all of which are actually drawn from the Mapping Resilience Report. So I'm going to do it just through sharing some headlines, but we know that environmental justice communities um, in particular are uniquely threatened by um, climate change impacts. And I'm thinking about these headlines really draw from examples in terms of hurricanes and flooding um, outside of California. But for APEN, especially um, thinking of Hurricane Harvey in Houston, we couldn't help but compare Houston and Richmond actually in thinking about the ways flooding kind of worsen the pollution and the exposure to toxics for folks that were living next to the petrochemical um, kind of facilities where with the flooding there was a release of um, tons of air pollutants, uh, water contaminants, um, and you know leading to adverse health impacts. So I wanted to start with that because we've historically worked with environmental justice communities right on the and addressing the health impacts from pollution from those facilities and then we think about the impact of flooding of those sites and it's um, although we don't necessarily have those hurricanes in California, that intersection is something that we're really kind of curious about and looking to um, assess the risk in the longer term. I also wanted to um, point out another example around neighborhoods lacking green space. And I reviewed your website just to kind of understand kind of the realm of work y'all do around climate adaptation and resilience. And I, saw some work around access to green space. Um, and, you know, we know that urban heat islands worsen the effects of extreme heat. Um, and we know, also know that neighborhoods concentrated with low-income communities of color have less tree coverage, specifically in California's urban areas. Um, and these communities not only are often, you know, have, lack access to green space, but they also have limited public transportation to parks and beaches, putting these areas at higher risk for the health impacts of extreme heat. And I would love to hear more from you all if um, there are projects and work, you all are, work you're doing around kind of closing that access gap. 
We're also thinking about homeless um, communities, which we know are a group that are severely impacted by various climate impacts, whether that be extreme precipitation and flooding to wildfires, um, as well as extreme heat, which is especially dangerous for homeless people due to barriers in accessing cooling services, food, and shelter. Um, and that's something that we can't really ignore in California, and especially as an organization working in the Bay Area. Um, Next, we are also thinking about indigenous communities um, who are dependent on natural resources for substance hunting, fishing, and farming, as well as for cultural survival. Um, and we know these communities are also especially impacted by climate change. Um, and so the impacts of sea level rise, such as saline intrusion and drought, are contributing to fisheries collapse throughout the world, threatening food security for communities that are reliant on um, fish use. Um, and that includes those that are in California. And so in north, northwestern California, drought has disseminated the salmon stock, which is an important food and resource for a multitude of tribes. Um, and so for indigenous communities, um, connecting to cultural heritage can, can be an important way to cope with the traumas of colonization and structural violence. And um, by kind of endangering the substance subsistence hunting and fishing practices of those communities um, were, you know, impacting community health as well as their economic and nutritional well-being. And finally, I want to point to rural communities. Um, we know the California drought has exacerbated already low groundwater levels, contributing to the Central Valley having the most contaminated drinking water in the country. Um, and so we're really thinking about, in this context, rural communities, poor communities, and Latinx communities living in the region. And so that's just a kind of um, sample of the types of community impacts that we try to highlight in the report and uplift some of those um, examples and stories to name that the way that the climate gap manifests. And so recognizing this climate gap what can we do to address those unique risks, protect those that are most impacted, and create opportunities to thrive? And that's where our Mapping Resilience Report comes in um, and, and tries to really think through answering that question and, and um, you know, kind of paving a path forward. So, one impetus for this report in the effort of, you know, reviewing framework, mapping kind of tools and frameworks was Calumbiroscreen, which I'm sure um, all of you are familiar with. Um, but Calumbiroscreen for an envi environmental justice communities really uplifted and centered the needs of EJ communities in state policy making, um, as well as local and regional policy making. Um, and we see Calenviroscreen as really a model for applying data in decision making to address those cumulative impacts from poverty and pollution. Um, but we have to, um, we all, we know, many of us know, and we have to point out that Calenviroscreen is, um, was never designated to depict climate vulnerability. And therefore, it doesn't have indicators related to climate change threats or how communities kind of cope and adapt. And that was a gap that we were looking to further explore. And I want to name that um, Kellen Viral Screen is a powerful tool for what its kind of intention was. And we still, um, we really like, it's fundamental to a lot of our advocacy around pollution and poverty. Um, but uh, there's more that we wanted to look at in the context of climate change. So just a brief kind of overview of what's in the report, and I do have some copies up here for folks that um, would like a hard copy. It's also on our website. Um, we open up with that background on communities that are disproportionately impacted from climate change related threats, again, similar to that opening of examples I just provided. We also offer key definitions and principles for vulnerability and resilience, really um, compiling definitions and um, sets of principles already established from partner organizations and um, and really from a framing around uh, centered around justice and equity. 
We then, the heart of the report is a review of over 40 existing indicators, data, and tools um, related to understanding community impacts from climate change. Um, there's a whole section after that on data limitations and knowledge gaps of where we see quantitative indicators not really able to capture um, some of the, the, the impacts that we see. Uh, the next session, section is around lessons learned from the development and use of indicators in related fields, mostly lessons learned from the use and application of Calenviro screens um, as a mapping tool. And then finally, we close with some anticipated uses and policy applications for how to use um, the, the data and tools in policy making. So that's kind of the report, and I will just share some top lines of the recommendations after we did this really comprehensive landscape analysis of what we um, came away with. So the first kind of recommendation is that climate vulnerability should be addressed, assessed by region and based on climate threat. And so we know that climate impacts vary based on biophysical setting, climate, and jurisdictional factors. Um, and so, for example, threats from sea level rise are specific to California's coastal communities. And I think um, we also know there are unique population characteristics, for example, between rural and urban areas. And therefore, those types of variations really caution us against making statewide comparisons. Um, is that, and therefore, we, it really warrants a more regional and climate impact specific lens. So, you know, Calenviro Screen does actually make statewide comparisons, but I think that's dangerous in the context of climate change because each region varies um, in terms of the impacts and the population. So, and I think that type of regional lens does support the application of data since a lot of planning does happen at the regional and local level. And so just to name the specific climate threats that we looked at in this report, were wildfires, drought, extreme heat, and flood risk, both from kind of extreme precipitation as well as sea level rise. So another kind of key finding is that there is a varied landscape of frameworks. Some are statewide, um, some are more on a national scale developed by federal agencies like the EPA. Some are specific to um, a certain impact like extreme heat, while some integrate a multitude of impacts within one um, platform. And so there's a lot that we see. And um, what we did see is that there were relatively few frameworks that kind of combined multiple factors into a sing single framework to think about this issue from a more intersectional perspective. Um, and I just want to name some of the frameworks that stood out to us that you all can kind of look into and explore further, and maybe you've looked into them already. But there's the California Healthy Places Index that we really um, thought was a strong, um, comprehensive framework that included both climate threats alongside socioeconomic factors and um, adaptive like neighborhood characteristics. The CalBRAVE Climate Change Health Vulnerabilities Indicator, Vulnerability Indicators which I will name are incorporated into the Healthy Places Index. The Energy Commission has a report on social vulnerability to climate change. Um, and then there's a climate change vulnerability screening index developed by researchers, and that's more of a research report. And then two specific frameworks on uh, that are kind of impact specific include the climate heat assessment tool um, and then climate central surging seas risk risk zone map, which I will say like that interface was quite user friendly and accessible and easy to understand and we really like that one for um, kind of depicting the impacts of sea level rise and flood risk. I want to name some other ones specific to sea level rise and flooding. Um, so ABAG has their community indicators for flood risk. And that one, um, is, it's not necessarily a mapping tool, but it is um, a set of 10 indicators that um, ABAG as well as San Francisco BCDC came up with around um, community kind of vulnerability indicators related to flood risk. Specifically, 
They include language, access to vehicle, housing cost burden, race and ethnicity, education, housing tenure, transportation cost burden, income, and age. And you can kind of explore that further, but it is a, it's an indicator set versus a platform. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists has a report entitled When Rising Seas Hit Home. And that is actual mapping plat platform that um, identifies which communities will be chronically inundated during this century and when that will happen. Um, and then Coastal Resilience California from the Nature Conservancy um, looks at nature-based coastal flood risk reduction solutions. And so they have an online mapping tool that you can look at sea level rise and coastal hazard projections. Um, but they also look at inter do an evaluation of interventions, um, including the economics of nature-based adaptation strategies, future habitat changes, and considerations for community or regional planning. So I, may, I like that one a lot because they also include this, a lens in their mapping tool around interventions and the solution side. Um, so those are just a couple I would highlight. They're named in the report and expanded upon. Um, one of the, just based on that abundance, one of the kind of critical recommendations we came up, is, came up with is based on this abundance, researchers don't need to develop new climate vulnerability indicator sets because there's a rich volume. You know, for, we, did, we reviewed 44 and that wasn't even exhaustive, right? And it was really a California specific lens. But there really is a rich volume of existing frameworks to identify the people and places that are most impacted or will be most impacted by climate threats. And in fact, there's a lot of redundancy across frameworks. Um, and so we assert that there's enough underlying data and established indicators um, that tell us what the relevant kind of factors are that depict the, the climate science. Um, and so there really isn't an imminent need for more data and more tools. And I think this is really important, and please like spread the message, because <laughs> I still to this day get lots of um, uh, kind of like requests or inquiries about like, oh, we're looking to develop this tool, and it's like, well, there's so much out there. How are you integrating with that kind of existing landscape? We do, though, assert, despite that kind of abundance, that we do need kind of a centralization and a little bit more integration of what is our, the work that's already been done. Because there isn't kind of a comprehensive platform or framework that connects the social vulnerabilities with the climate um, change impacts. And that, that hasn't been fully realized yet. And because there's a lack of consistency, I can't say there's one place that agency, agency staff, decision makers can go to to look at kind of to adapt um, and, and explore the data based on their needs. And we would say that um, the ability of so much data is really leading to a paralysis of action. In some ways, there's an overwhelm of, well, there's so many tools, which is the one that I should use or, or where can I, what's the one website I can even go to just to kind of explore what's out there. Um, and know that it's user friendly, that it's actionable. And so I think that's what we see as an opportunity for policymakers to really um, connect to a framework that's streamlined and that's actionable um, to, to really apply the data in decision making. And I think, again, it's mirroring and complementary to Tell Enviro's screen because that is one kind of repository in space that, that connects, again, those socioeconomic vulnerabilities with these environmental threats in one really user-friendly, um, streamlined platform. And so what would this platform look like? It would include indicators for exposure, um, like the climate change impacts that I had mentioned before. Um, it would have indicators around population sensitivity, like poverty, language access, elderly, and renters, amongst many others. And then also integrate adaptive capacity factors, like tree canopy, vehicle access, and impervious surfaces. And it would do, support um, users to kind of do some of that work of, if I'm concerned about flood risk, what are the appropriate population sensitivity and adaptive capacity factors that are relevant to that impact? Because they really differ. So for example, um, you know, air conditioning access, for example, is one of those things that's really specific to extreme heat that you wouldn't want to be 
considering in the context of other threats, per se. And then I want to close with our kind of final recommendation, which is that mapping alone doesn't tell the full story um, of the ways that we know communities experience climate change impacts. Um, and there are, there are really some limits in data collection that imply that many relevant factors and trends underlying community vulnerability are either overlooked or reflect inaccuracies. And so, um, you know, for example, our review shows that there is a wealth of indicators around population sensitivity and some of those socioeconomic indicators but fewer for adaptive capacity and reflecting the way communities kind of may or may not, or can and cannot cope and respond. For example, transportation access, the location of cooling centers, and even this notion of like community cohesion, which is like how much support or civic engagement or social ties do folks have to be able to um, respond. There's some other specific gaps that we talk about. So certain climate impacts, um, I named here some frameworks on coastal flooding actually don't account for land subsidence. Um, that's not an issue for a lot of the models that are used in California, but it's something that came up in the review around um, some of the limits of particular projections. Um, and then also this, I just want to bring back this piece around the intersections with environmental justice, which is still kind of, um, you know, not fully understood, particularly the environmental justice implications of flooding in terms of toxic contamination and worsening um, pollution impact. Uh, in terms of socioeconomic factors, rural communities, um, most of the data used in vulnerability mapping is actually derived from densely populated areas. And so, um, there's a lot of data inaccuracies when it comes to the, uh, the trends and kind of um, factors impacting rural communities. And then that only not yet affects rural communities, but also other underserved communities like Native American tribes and undocumented migrant workers. Um, and then this notion of employment impacts, which came up a lot in our review. Right, but there are these specific economic losses and um, health impacts due to climate change, specifically among agricultural, tourism, domestic workers, a kind of whole host of, of, of California's workforce that mapping doesn't really kind of allow us to explore because mapping is often very like residential, community focused, it's where people live and gives you that sense, even though a lot of folks are, you know, spend most of their time at work and, um, yeah, there are these kind of economic impacts that just aren't kind of well captured by mapping. And so just in light of those gaps, our final recommendation is that public officials should ground truth and complement vulnerability mapping with community expertise. Um, and we should really, I, I caution folks to rely on any single mapping framework to identify and capture all the factors. But we should really be into integrating the power of this quantitative information with experiential knowledge and community stories. And that's where community engagement and a role of really connecting with community-based organizations and advocates and residents comes in um, to make sure that our mapping um, processes and kind of the vulnerability assessments are inclusive and participatory. Um, and so I, just to kind of wrap up, I want to name that data is powerful to, because it can depict the interacting and cumulative impacts of climate change. And it really operationalizes that notion that I started with about addressing the underlying systemic inequalities alongside the growing climate threats, right? Because we can integrate the climate science with what we know about the socioeconomic factors and neighborhood characteristics that communities are living in. And therefore, we believe that this piece of mapping is really powerful in the endeavor of identifying vulnerable communities for the sake of targeting resources, services, and projects. And that's a policy opportunity that I think we're undertaking um, now that this report is out there as we kind of share with folks the report about how to really apply and operationalize the data. So I want to end with a quote just to leave you all with some inspiration. 
Um, we, and just thinking about, because I've talked a lot about climate vulnerability. Um, vulnerability is a consequence, not a condition. Conventional approaches to adaptation and mitigation view vulnerability as a characteristic or condition of groups of people and not as a circumstance or consequence of the ways social groups have been historically and systemically marginalized and included, excluded from opportunity. As a result, the policy and practices that have been brought to bear don't address the underlying historical roots of vulnerability. These views exclude these groups from having a voice in setting policy priorities or allocating resources to address the issues. And then the key point here is that rather than being viewed as victims to be protected and saved, vulnerable communities should instead define, develop, and drive the solution. And I want to leave you all with that as just a framing for what comes next and what you all in the room and what we can work on together. Um, so with that, that's kind of the end of my presentation. Um, my uh, The link to the report is here if you want to take a look on it. Uh, uh, take a look on our website, my email address, <laughs> and thank you. And I know that there, um, I do want to like to have, I mean, we have around 25 minutes for questions, I'm definitely happy to answer, but I did have some questions for you all in case there aren't questions for me, which is just thinking about, um, with this information, what actionable steps can you take to integrate an equity lens into your work now and today? And what opportunities are there within your current work to advance some of the report's recommendations? Um, and then just more specifically, um, which vulnerable populations may be impacted by or could benefit from your work? So wanting to make sure we have a two-way conversation in the time that we have, but I'm also happy to clarify or answer questions. And just one quick announcement for those of you joining us online or on the phone. We'll take some questions from the room first, and then we'll open it up to your questions, which you can type into the question box, and I will read out loud time. Mm -hmm. I know I have a question. Thanks. That was super interesting. Um, and I totally agree with that. Like, there's sort of too many too much data in a way, or like I want to keep developing a new tool. But one I didn't see on your list, and I'm wondering if you guys looked at or if it's out there, um, is data about air quality. Because it seems like that's becoming obviously an obvious impact of climate change. And is there good information about that? And is it yeah. in your report as to where you go? Yeah, that's a really great question um, and a complicated one because um, so Cal Enviro Screen, we would say, does a really good job in capturing ex existing kind of air quality issues, right, that communities are, communities are facing today. And we have existing efforts to even strengthen that monitoring to, to better refine that data, right? Um, so for air pollution right now, like in, in the kind of today scenario, we look at Cal Enviro Screen. But there are all these kind of cascading effects from climate change on worsening air quality, which I think from our perspective is actually a data gap and it's included in the data gaps section because there isn't, I mean, it's difficult to do. Um, one of the reports, the Energy Commission Social Vulnerability to Climate Change mm -hmm. attempted to do this. This report is from 2012 though, so it's a little outdated at this point, um, which is another issue where, you know, the tools aren't often updated, but I think the worsening impacts of air quality from wildfire smoke as well is just something that's really difficult to quantify um, and project um, outside of kind of the monitoring ha that happens in real time as a result. Um, and so that's definitely kind of a gap that um, I'm not actually sure if folks are looking to kind of undertake and, and further refine that, but it's definitely something that's not well quantified or documented in the existing tools. <clears throat> On that same note about like all of these tools that are out there, so I know in this report you looked at over 40 tools that look at some particular aspect of climate vulnerability, and I'm just curious what the process was to come up with those, like how did you find these tools? Because it seems like so nebulous.
nebulous and like you're saying there's no centralized mapping platform but i don't think there's a centralized list of tools either yeah so i'm just curious to hear how you went about finding them. yeah um i think one one way we narrowed our review i mean at some point we just had to stop because it could have been over a hundred but i think we had a lens around really wanting to highlight tools that were doing more than just pro project um uh visualizing you know one projected impact but doing a little bit more of integrating multiple factors um and giving us a more of a holistic kind of sense of the um you know the different layers that are contributing to vulnerability so I think that was just one kind of like criteria. Um, and then there was also a very much a regional focus in that although we, we opened the report with some national uh, sort of like frameworks that are developed by federal agencies and are available for all of the US, we really wanted to spotlight frameworks that are specific to California, given that a lot of our advocacy is happening um, you know, at the state level. And so there was both kind of a scope, but like focus, where we really honed in on statewide frameworks. Um, and then again, that just the lens around that intersectional, integrating multiple factors into one tool, but beyond just the science or social vulnerability. And I think again, from us as a community-based organization, environmental justice organization, that incorporation of socioeconomic factors, neighborhood conditions, is something that's um, not as frequently done in the context of these maps. So that was another kind of lens. Um, so, you know, right now we have Prop 68 and we have some specific amounts that need to go to the really disadvantaged community. So that's based on income. Um, so would you say that, like, your recommendation would be to overlay another um, Aspects besides just economic and disadvantage communities, and they were, which ones are more vulnerable mm -hmm. based on some other factors. Is it so? So just to be clear, I mean, I'm familiar with Prop 68, but is the um, is it just the single kind of indicator for disadvantage income? That's how it was defined. Yeah. Okay, uh, but I also believe maybe this isn't Prop 68. There was a uh, um, also, a consideration around kind of like part four neighborhoods, like tr access there, to parks. Not in the funds that we're administering. Okay. I, no. Okay. Yeah, for us, we just have like percent set aside for the half the benefit. So we are looking at community and that's defined for Prop 68 as by income. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, so. Just the fact that, that there is that kind of carve out, I think, is great. And starting with income is useful. I think mean, poverty is probably one of the most important factors to be looking at. And um, we would say, and I, I wouldn't say, you know, you can also become overwhelmed by incorporating too many indicators as well, which is why we do think each agency and, and program really has to adapt the set of indicators to the particular um, application and intervention. And so it's really thinking about, okay, what are the inequalities embedded in the, the program or the, the funding that we're trying to get at? Is it solely income or are there other, uh, other factors that we know that prevent access to the intervention or this type of funding? And I mean, I would argue like language access, for example, linguistic isolation is one of those that also comes up a lot as um, creating inequities in the ways communities are able to access um, different types of interventions. Um, public transportation or like transit access or just whether interventions are accessible um, is another. So it really depends on the project. Um, and up to the implementer to kind of think about what's that sweet spot of the set of indicators. But I do think there's something really powerful about looking at the intersection between poverty and if it is trying to address a specific climate threat, the, the projections or the data around the, you know, the impact. Um, 
Um, because then you're starting to get at those vulnerability hotspots, right? Of like, this community is going to be severely impacted by flooding in, you know, this timeline or extreme heat. And it is, um, there is, you know, a large concentration of, you know, poor households. Like, th then you're getting at the hotspots. Mm -hmm. um, but I wouldn't want to answer without knowing more about the specific program. So, uh, so you said no more data, no more, um, but then you talked about sort of a platform to integrate all the available information that is out. What do you envision that platform to be? Or like, who do you envision taking that type of work on? That's a great question because that is what I'm working on right now, or supporting. Um, and I think you made a good point around, like, we don't even, let alone an integrated platform, we don't have a website or like one place that people can go to see the list. We tried to do that with our report in, in, a, in, in part. I don't, again, it's not exhaustive, right? Um, but I, I didn't want to create something new because that would take a long time. Like that's what our report asserts is that like to you know, have legislation that says create this new tool, like that's gonna take a long time. I think since it's all out there, we're actually working with, um, some of the researchers that developed the Healthy Places Index to kind of, they were really ex excited and interested in our report and they were like, we'll update our tool to better kind of reflect some of the recommendations um, and allow for the types of um, tailoring that your report asserts around like taking a climate impact and it populating with a set of socioeconomic and adaptive capacity factors. And that, again, the user can um, tailor and say, actually, I don't want to look at all of these things. I want to look at a subset, but allowing some of that um, overlay. Um, and so the Healthy Places Index is a tool that we're working to update to, to basically be that platform. Um, I think, um, and they draw from, like, you know, data from CalADAPT. They, they've integrated a lot of data sources from complementary mapping. Um, I think we're still struggling with the question of, is it one tool or maybe a few tools? Um, because there are some other, like a couple of other tools out there that I think complement it well. So we're trying to figure out what that sweet spot is of, is it just one place people can go or is it kind of a landing page with a couple of tools based on people's needs. I think one other piece of the, um, and I'm curious from you all like how this sounds, but one piece that we really named as in, in order to make the data actionable is training and resources and a little bit of education, whether that's through tutorials or one pager or just in the mapping platform itself to allow for, for decision makers to understand how the data can be applied. Because sometimes you go to the tool and it's like, well, I don't know what is possible or how I could connect this to a program. Um, and so offering some of those use case scenarios or ap potential applications of how the data can be made actionable, I think that's more on the education, outreach, and like kind of training side. Um, and I think there's a technical assistance piece too, because oftentimes community groups or applicants are asked to look at a map or look at a tool and identify why their neighborhood, you know, demonstrates needs. But how are agencies kind of supporting applicants to do that exploration of the data too? So it's like multiple avenues just to get folks um, more kind of trained up on how to how to look at these and make them um, useful. It's great to have you here because, like, just keeping that conversation going about what you're working on. So, the Conservancy has a new platform called See the Future, which is basically the list version of this, like, centralized platform where we tried to mm. put together all of the sea level rise related uh, viewers that people could use when they're starting that mapping process. And it has some of that, like, educational side, like, built to be really straightforward. To easy to use, but it is sea level rise specific, but definitely good to hear that you guys are working those kind of things. Yeah. We're trying that in like one little thing. But that, that is really great. I think that is completely aligned with what our report is. Assertive.
setting is needed. Um, and so I'm excited to take a look at that and I think just continue to amplify and making sure other agencies are, are actively <coughs> integrating that would be and um, like advocates and community groups I think would be really helpful. What about Caladabs? Is that something that you think needs to be kind of upgraded to incorporate more yeah, it's a that's a really great question. Um, Teladap, from my perspective, so it's in the report we review it. It it feels like more of a like a repository for data or like a source of data, right? It has a lot of the rigorous climate science and where people can draw from it and integrate it into tools and frameworks. Um, so it's a source of data from my perspective. I haven't found it as kind of user friendly as a community advocate, um, it's, it's, it's difficult to kind of navigate as compared to some of these other visualization platforms that are out there. And so um, I think tools should be continually continually drawing from Caladap because it really does have the, the, the strong sort of base of evidence and research and updated. Um, it's an interesting question though because there is so SGC has a climate change research program that's funding a lot of this updating of mapping, and one of the projects is making Caladap more, uh, you know, drawing from user needs and interviews, making it um, more actionable, like kind of improving it and updating it to meet people's needs. And so that's actually a, an effort that's ongoing right now. So I'm tracking that and curious to see where it goes and if it can complement my fear is that, that that effort is happening in a siloed way without kind of talking to all these other ongoing efforts. And so I'm hoping that they're connecting with other um, researchers. But I think Teladapt is a great, um, I mean, it's a, like, it's important. It has an important place in this landscape. Um, and they even, I mean, they attempted to incorporate Calenviro screen layers over some of the Caladap data. Again, it's difficult and it's a little outdated to play with, but um, I think they're exploring. Um, and similarly, just in case folks are wondering, SGC's climate change research program has two other studies. One that is actually Rachel Marlowe Frosch at UC Berkeley is looking to actually update the surging seas risk zone map to incorporate those environmental justice kind of considerations around risk and a flooding of hazardous sites, which I think is really interesting in the project we're helping with. Um, and then uh, there's a heat intervention tool that is being updated um, through the Healthy Places and Next Zone existing tool, but better kind of modeling the gaps in terms of vulnerable communities to heat. So there are these mapping efforts that are being that are happening at the same time, and I just hope they integrate. And I'm gonna, I'm trying to do that. <laughs> awesome. So we have two comments from some of our viewers. Clessie mm -hmm. Bennett from BCDC wanted to give us an update that the ABAC BCDC community flood risk indicators, they're now working to put them into a user-friendly public mapping platform. Yay. And so at English with CDPH. Um, they're working on mapping wildfire smoke exposure for California. Oh, good. Look, there's like things <laughs> happening that we. The gaps are being filled. Yeah, that's really, really <laughs> great. Both of those things are great to hear. How does your face and then you need to be able to help advocate for integration of the mapping to the community that you have to know? I feel like it was a one-off just like floating along. Like, there's an opportunity for input, but. Yeah. What's the community of our council steps? So, if there's any other ways that we can help kind of advocate to integrate those mapping tools? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask to see the future kind of like is a website or a platform. Mm -hmm. um, are, is there, I know you were saying it's kind of the focus on sea level rise and has a lot of climate science, but is there also a lens or incorporation of um, or in any of the tools that you highlight around like the socioeconomic or kind of, I don't know, some neighborhood, like population factors that 
Yeah. Overlay. So it, it looks that we have about 10 tools that all are looking at the, at sea level rise in a slightly different lens. Um, and essentially, see the future is like a, a filter and compare platform where if you have a project, you can go and pick the one that fits your project the best. Okay. And we do have a, one of our like filter options is socioeconomic, essentially. Um, and I'd say maybe half of the maps or half of the viewers that we feature have some sort of incorporated socioeconomics, but they are all different methods. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it, I think that that's one of the things that we've been talking about internally, but how to make it clearer, like if you wanted to look at something specific, but for now, mm -hmm. you can you can say like, I would like to see some type of socioeconomic, but each of those tools is different. And so we would like to mm -hmm. figure out something that makes it a little simpler there. That's like a really important part. Yeah, that's helpful. And I do think it is dependent on the intervention. Like I think we should always be starting with, okay, what is the grant or the project or the program that I'm deploying because that also informs, you know, whether the socioeconomic indicators are, you know, relevant, right? Or if it's really about where we're just going to be seeing, you know, the worst kind of most imminent risk just based on the um, kind of the science, the climate science part of it. So I think that we have to be mindful of that. But if it's something more community oriented or that's looking to like, um, benefit or in, has implications for neighborhoods and people or housing, then I think then we should be thinking about that. Like I know there's this whole conversation. I don't really want to. I I, it's, I don't want to dive too deeply in it, but around managed retreat and just like um, thinking about you know demographic shifts or like actually moving in light of sea level rise threats. But that's like a whole kind of there's just so many community impacts to that that I think require us to really think about the mobility and the um, yeah the mobility of people and whether they can or can't do that and whether they're renters or homeowners whether they have flood insurance like there's just so many factors that go into whether you can you want to or can afford to just move right so that's just like one example I wanted to offer. Um, and yeah. some people can and have the privilege to, or like can think about this in the forward sense, and some, you know, wouldn't have that ability without. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one question from our audience online. So this question is from Anne Markill. A lot of emphasis in the Bay Area has been on sea level rise, but it seems that flooding from creeks and rivers is also a critical challenge for vulnerable communities. Mm. Did your work find this gap too? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, flood risk was a difficult one to kind of organize because there is the longer term risk of flooding from sea level rise, which has kind of a unique set of responses in a more forward thinking way. And then there is the, um, there's that, there's and like extreme precipitation and rainfall that has a kind of a different um, set of impacts and implications. And so it was difficult. Um, I'd say the gap there is sometimes the tools don't really kind of neatly differentiate the differences and, and how to look at those things both that there's intersections and also unique conditions. Um, so I'd say that was a gap and something that was like difficult to discern in terms of the multitude of just the way those play out really differently and how the solutions are really different. So I'd say that was a gap um, for sure. And less so from the creeks um, and rivers, I don't, I, I didn't run into a lot of data around that or like that risk. Well, thank you, Annie. Thank you. Thank you all for your engagement. And looking forward, so when Sona comes, I think it'll be a really good part two because her report, Green Lighting's report is really focused on the intervention side of like how do we make equity real in policies and grants and things like that. And so this is really about like the who and the where and vulnerability piece, but um, her report is really about the how 
um, to, to in integrate those. So, and, hope that goes along. Well. And that talk will be next month. And the invite will come out to everyone listening shortly. <laughs> Great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. For anyone online who didn't have your question answered, we'll try to follow up with you. Have a great day.